Hello everybody, my name is D, but you can call me the Riddler if you like, and welcome to the Decap, where I take a TTRPG actual play and condense it down so that you can catch the latest episodes. Today we will once again be talking about Lorewind. Lorewind is a homebrew D&D 5e actual play campaign run by the lovely folks over at Gut Punch RP. If you haven't seen the first Decap for Lorewind, which goes over the prologue, episodes 1 through 17, then I suggest you go watch that first to make sure that you can keep pace with everything that we're talking about. Or just watch this one. I don't know. I'm not your fucking parent. But that's enough rambling. We have a whole lot of episodes, specifically 17 through 38, and a whole bunch of dice to roll. So without further ado, let's get into the decap. Welcome to Lorewind, where adventurers of all kinds can fill their pockets with coin and bellies with ale. Townsfolk need help with all manner of odd jobs, but take caution when asked to move outside of civilization. For lost and weary souls seek to squash your light and bring it to their vile masters. Trickster fay torment and trick for entertainment. Nobles seek discreet action as much as swift force. Be wary of an alliance with one, for it may bring trouble with another. They all have a tale to tell, but which one holds the truth? It's hard to say, unless, of course, you... We last saw our party arrive in the city of Falkvel, a city that finds itself built around the base of a volcano with a very stringent magical policy. All users of magic must have a permit to perform their magical talents. Before they make their way to a nearby inn, they stop by what equates to the magical TSA, and yes, they're exactly as annoying as you think they are, Rightly needing a drink afterward, the party heads to a brothel called the House of Purple Silk, where Kyola saw a familiar face. Mentally drifting off to her own world and trying to enter an employees-only area for a bit, Kyola eventually tries to sneak into the back dressed as one of the brothel's workers. We find out that this person Ki uh, Kyola knows is named Inyal, and they would like to talk somewhere more quiet. Meanwhile, Annabelle meets up with a woman named Natasha, who we'll get to later, and the two share some whiskey while we learn that she worships a god called Loivatar, who, while not directly related to Saloon or Shar, does work with both. Back with Kyola, Inyal, who is also a furbolg, explains that she was captured and thrown aboard a boat. Seeing a chance to escape, she left Mardinia and came to Laurelwyn. We also learn that Kyola spent a few years in the Underdark until her mentor disappeared. She came back to the surface, and they were still chasing people. She ran into Scotty, our human fighter, and Bjorn, our human barbarian, and has just decided to stick with them. Though she can leave at any time if Njal wants to. <clears throat> she, however, has mysterious girl boss shit to do, so Kyola somewhat sadly returns to the tavern. Meanwhile, at the tavern, Jacques, a member of the local guard, flirts with Bjorn so well that time stands still. Oh, no. It's just fairy godmother Vafir. They tell Bjorn that they're mildly concerned that the party is going to fuck up royally and heavily implies that they need to stay focused on the task at hand. As such, the following morning, the party heads to a library to meet their contact Lorelei, an expert in exotic sylvan language, and she explains that the sorrow sworn that the party have fought before are primordial creatures devoted to Shar. Only one would be enough to wreak mass havoc, but all seven could help Shar return to the material plane itself. She continues and explains that the witch in King Stefan's grudge caused the witch to curse his daughter, whose 16th birthday is in four days. Lorelai says she'll research more and meet them at the tavern later. In the morning, Annabelle gets a holy symbol for traveling and also tries to steal the dream potion that Bjorn has been watchfully keeping. Bjorn catches this, but after Annabelle promises to be careful, lets her take it. Bad choice, Bjorn. Uh... <laughs> Later in that evening, Lorelai appears and reveals that she's lost her job at the library and has some very interesting details about the witch. It turns out that she worships an arch devil, an arch devil called Glacia. Uh, Glacia has a pair of lustful primordials and is number six of the Sorrow Sworn. Their weak point is their hearts, which is relatable. Lorelai also tells the party that the witch can turn into a dragon and her name is Maleficent. Jess, you little sh- Kyola is on a date! This is cute as fuck, and I love it. Uh, she does a more official debrief on her party, and her partner reveals that she's also been traveling with some humans and a half-elf. Kyola then offers to leave again with Inyal when she leaves with her party, and Inyal ensures her that she would go anywhere with Kyola. That evening, Annabelle tries another dose of dream potion and dreams of being back on the sea, aboard her old ship, with the captain yelling at her to get off the deck. 
All of the sky around her is unnaturally saturated, and then shifts and melds until it becomes a city instead of a sea. A dream stalker, oddly seeming to not want to hurt Annabelle, chirps out in a low voice, No, no, no. You're not ready yet. Not ready at all, the creature muses. And then in a blink of an eye, Annabelle finds herself in dark, still water, with the Dream Stalker's dark, patterned horns protruding outward. It lunges for Annabelle, who wakes with a fright and looks around to notice that she is not where she fell asleep. Scotty, who is on watch, sees Annabelle vanish and, reasonably panicked, wakes the rest of the party who use Bubbles, a, pup a puppy they saved a few days earlier, to sniff her down. However, Bubbles is moving unnaturally fast, even for the goodest of boys, and the party watches as the galloping steps turn into leaps, as wings sprout and Bubbles becomes not only a dragon, but Maleficent herself. She believes that Annabelle was drawn to her castle because of the concentration of magical items inside, and proves that she's not an out-and-out -out enemy by retrieving Annabelle and protecting the party from a volley of attacks. Both Corvina and Jacques say good their goodbyes to the party the next day, and they begin their track to Altbach Heap. Maleficent reveals that the magical barrier Annabelle woke up inside was not one of her creation. She also explains that while one of them grows, glows a gradient of purple to green, the other glows from silver to gunmetal gray. Since this castle once belonged to Glacia herself, this magical oddity may have another layer to it. The party then ascends the tower and learns in many ways more than one that this is a puzzling place to be. After sharing some stories, fighting some elves, and busting a fucking move, the party encounters an elven woman who taunts Annabelle with the name of her missing, missing sister, Ellie. Moving further inside, the party manages to find a still-beating heart locked within an ornate chest. An attempt to destroy the heart only results in the box breaking, so the party tucks the heart away in their bag of holding, wondering if it belongs to the lustful sorrow swarm. A bit further in, the party meets a giant black owl who seems to be the architect of all of this, and after cryptically telling them she has what she wants, she disappears leaving behind only a wooden chest. Bjorn's bag of holding already holds the first heart, so the other Viking, Scotty, decides to carry this one. The air is thick and heavy. Mistakes are made and the box ends up in the hands of a treacherous succubus. Cackling madly, she takes the stolen heart and uses it to summon her wicked brother. The incubus and succubus fight and claw at the party. Scotty, Bjorn, Kyola, all charmed, and under the sway of this wicked pair, leaving Annabelle to struggle and to survive alone. Enjoying their new toys, the demon siblings kiss Bjorn and Kyola, pulling away with their souls fixed between their lips and our two party members dropping to the ground dead. Annabelle manages to unscramble Scotty's mind, and together they manage to slay the Incubus, though his sister escapes. Luckily, Sheriff Elizabeth Swan and her saloon crew compatriots manage to appear and resurrect the two fallen party members. Luna explains that the situation is somehow even more dire, as the followers of Shar are even further along than they thought. Mari teleports the party in time to see Loxley notch an arrow at Natasha. Managing to reverse the situation, Natasha not only stabs Loxley, but counterspells an attempt to heal him. She then opens a portal that leads to a place familiar to Annabelle, and runs through, and y'all following closely behind before it closes. Loxley explains that they managed to find the sheriff, whose weird powers stem from the somber weave taking her to a temple of Char. They continue to say that placing the first heart in the bag of holding allowed the succubus to access it through the extra-dimensional space and bring her corporeal form about. Maleficent reveals that the party have been away in the tower for three days and gives a few magical items to the group as they emerge. When Annabelle goes to bed that night, she feels a spell drape over her form, accompanied by a voice asking her not to resist. She dreams she's on the lower decks of Riptide's fortune and has a drink with Natasha, who asks Annabelle to join her in helping people who can't help themselves. Oh, and also that Ellie says hi. The party takes off toward Port Salon to find Riptide's fortune, which is still an amazing name for a ship, by the way. Annabelle's former ship, in fact. In an inn outside the city, a man introduces himself as Sullen, our human cleric and brand new party member. Who heard about the party from Nyx, a magic shop owner that the party knows? Sullen has sought out the party because they have one thing in common. Curses. 
Rasalan is also cursed, and his curse involves the same creepy owl that the party had seen before. Once night falls, Scotty's mind is clouded with thoughts of a tarot reading Sullen had done earlier in the night. A storm. Lightning. Thunder. Thor appears, descending from the clouds themselves, and asks in a low, rumbling voice why Scotty would ever question her worth. He summons a manticore, which attacks Scotty. She tries to fight it off with her bare hands. There's claws, teeth, and blood. And then the earth rumbles beneath her feet and lightning gathers at her hands as steel and stone sail through the air and Mjolnir slams into the open hand until the manticore lies dead. Scotty looks up to Thor, hair still alight with electricity. The god of thunder nods and simply says, You are worthy, for you are my champion. After some time on the road, the party arrives in Port Salon, where an Annabelle spots Riptide's fortune, only to find out that it is now owned by Captain Killian Jones. When Annabelle inquires where the former crew is now, the information is suddenly cut off by the city falling under a swift and powerful attack. The captain decides to hire the party to work aboard the ship. Looking back at the wreckage of the city, the party spots two elves who seem to be calling the shots as they sail away from the destruction. But let's get back to the furry lesbians. Uh, Kyola and her partner, Enyal, who also made it onto the ship, spend an evening together while the party, out of character, hurls spells at them, both instead of giving any modicum of privacy. Elsewhere on the ship, Sullen and Annabelle have had a very frank discussion, during which we learn that Annabelle's parents have had their memories cursed to the point where they wouldn't recognize Annabelle or her sister Ellie. And just then, a black feather falls across the camera's vision, and Annabelle freezes in time. A soft voice echoes through the air, speaking to Sullen. It'll cost you what it always costs you. Time snaps back into being, and Sullen uses the Greater Restoration Scroll he was gifted by the mysterious entity to perform a ritual on Annabelle's blood and both of her father's as well. As magic swirls around Annie's father's, in a flash, they both gasp and call her name out in shock and confusion. The reunited family members embrace as Sullen casts a glance to a shadowy corner that promises more rewards in return for more favors done. Bjorn, however, is not happy with the new addition to the party. Rightfully wary of a new person that none of the party has known for more than a few days, Bjorn demands more answers out of the newcomer, cornering them while separate from the rest of the party on the ship. The conversation is terse and short, with Bjorn learning little but Sullen promising to keep whatever it is that guides him under control. Let's hope he can keep that promise. And then a drow looking for something reappears. Not like something something, but like something. He's a magical chaos orb that the party is holding. Uh, and manages to teleport the entire party to a lush forest. After a brief battle, the party flees and stumbles out onto the road where a familiar face happens to be riding by. Yes, it is once again fairy godmother Vafir, and since this is their first meeting, Sullen finally gets to bask in his glory. Speaking of which, the party is very heavy-handedly suggested to attend a party in honor of the Queen of the Summer Court. Snapping his fingers and dressing them elegantly, Vafir drags his charges along to meet said queen, who is apparently Vafir's mother. Hoping to keep appearances up, the party decide to play along and make Vafir look like a model prince in exchange for being taken home. While attending this party, the group notices a large boulder being gripped by a woman in sparkling breastplate. The challenge is to pull the blade stuck in the boulder free that the woman carries. Scotty very excitedly pulls and pulls on the sword, but to no avail. Bjorn, on the other hand, grabs the pommel and the blade swings freely from the stone. The queen approaches rather calmly, and as Bjorn bows, sword in hand, she says there is no need to bow to one's betrothed. Hashtag himbo wedding, hashtag himbo king, hashtag Fay wild vacay 2021. After the party, and Bjorn especially are shell-shocked for a bit, the evening resumes, and Vafir and Sullen do just the flirtiest dancing ever. Oh my god, the quips, the back and forth, the sauce, delicious. No, 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 no. Um, <clears throat> anyway, the Queen and Bjorn have a quick aside about how if Bjorn truly doesn't want to marry her, he is under no obligation to do so, but passes on that the sword was enchanted to only be pullable by someone of a noble birth. Tucking that away for a bit, 
Bjorn also asks for help from people who know curses, leading Queen Elandriel to call over a magical advi advisor named Thoromir. After getting only surface level answers but appreciating the goodwill shown here, Bjorn offers the Queen a dance, which she accepts. They share a gentle moment that only two lives of differing length can, and the Queen departs. Bjorn tells Scotty to be easy, as her brother remains single, for now. Vafir hugs his fairy godchildren and sends them back to the material plane where they appear on an empty Riptide's fortune docked in Sangil Port. Off board, the party actually gets a break? Yeah. Yeah, the, the party gets a few days off. Uh, there's a bit of information and backstory, but in general, the party just get a few days of being people. After that relaxing time at land, the party grabs the supplies Riptide's fortune would need to shove off once more. As they are, we also learn that Natasha has been paying members of the crew aboard to be her personal shipping service, and Sullen agrees that Natasha is quite capable and suggests that the party earn some money by working with her as well. Annabelle and Bjorn are hesitant to do so, seeing as they aren't even exactly sure what Natasha's errand would entail, but Sullen's comments, however, catch Natasha's eye, and later when they are separate from the rest of the folks, she reinforces that she believes Sullen is a good investment. Later on, below deck, Kyola, while tending to horses, is met with Princess Vasmir, Vafir's sister, who swears she's not at all salty or upset that Kyola has a girlfriend, despite the drugs they shared during a party in the Feywild. Feeling she had nothing better to do, Kyola is absconded by Vasmir in the ensuing search, however. Sullen tries to contact Vafir, but he unfortunately hasn't been paying attention to the party recently and has no clue where Kyola would be. This conversation, however, is suspicious enough to prompt Bjorn to once again impose on Sullen as he's having secret convos off in dark hallways with nobody else. I mean, I can't really be that mad. After a terse trading of words, the two come to a shaky understanding of sharing their perspectives and seeing that their motivations are not so different, though the road that each is traveling to get there varies greatly. Meanwhile, at the Hamptons, not a joke, actual canon, Vasmir asks Kyola to tell her what exactly her deal is. Kyola assures that she is boring and uninteresting, simply a peasant from the Emerald Mountains whose life was torn apart and destroyed by war, like so many before her and so many after her. Vasmir disagrees, saying that Kyola has shown time and time again that she can affect change, and that she can affect a great deal more if she were to accept a fragment of Vasmir's power. Telling Kyola to think on it, she teleports our favorite furry back aboard the ship where the party very understandably rushes her. Sharing the experience with them all, Sullen advises Kyola to decline the offer of power. She responds in turn that she will take his counsel under advisement, but she'll make her own decision. In the morning, an ominous air hangs. None of the party seem to notice outwardly as the day progresses uneventfully until the sun hangs high in the noonday sky. Creatures assail the boat, each clawing their way onto the ship from the depths of the sea itself. Their moss and seaweed-covered forms crowd the deck as they assail the ship, wave after wave, intent on only one target. Annabelle. The party scrambles to defend our halfling rogue from the flurry of assailants, but with each cut and stab, Annabelle's vision flashes, remembering many dreams she's had before of creatures dragging her beneath the sea's surface. These dreams seem to be ringing true, as a thin hand clasps Annabelle and drags her beneath the waves. The party leaps into action, fighting tooth and nail to keep Annabelle within their grasp, and then elongated, white, shallow eyes that are voidal slowly morph onto the creature's, free onto the creature's features and Annabelle freezes before the party scatters the fish person into a pile of gore and retrieves Annabelle from the water. She insists that she's fine, and no, she fucking isn't. Sit down, you goddamn Looney Tune. What is wrong with you? The party group huddles and ensures Annabelle that whatever it is that cursed her, the entire party is willing to fight away. Annabelle has a moment of silently fiddling with the dream potion she obtained from Nyx, almost absentmindedly, but the party takes the bottle away from her. After a day of inaction, however, Annabelle convinces the party that while the potion is dangerous, she wants to take it. The Vikings agree to watch over her as she takes the potion. Her dream is wrought with danger, lostness. Permeating the air around as she calls out for Ellie, she sees deep, oceanic depths, bleak and lightless, but can just barely make out a figure, like a candle a mile away on a dark night. And then she starts awake.
sputtering seawater, but otherwise fine. Confused and upset, seeking more answers than what she uncovered the first time, Annabelle reaches for the dream potion again, but Scotty keeps it out of reach. Annabelle, undeterred, however, starts a small scuffle trying to get the potion back. The noise wakes up the rest of the party, and Annabelle demands the potion back, insisting that this time, two doses will not harm her. Selen tells the Vikings that if she wants to take it, then let her. Kyola cuts through the conversation, pointing out that Annabelle is beginning to sound like an addict. The scuffle continues a bit longer, but eventually the Vikings relent and give Annabelle back the potion, admitting that they probably couldn't keep it away from her if she really wanted to take it, but deeply recommending at least waiting until the next day. Annabelle takes a deep breath and assures the party that she is taking a calculated risk, and the errors of the past are not far from her mind. The party refuse to abandon Annabelle and stay with her despite dis disagreeing with her opinion. Deep within the potion-induced dream and with Sullen watching through his mental leak that's been established, unbeknownst to Sullen, however, a black feather that Annie grabs during the dream delivers a message. A dire warning, in fact, that she is not meant to be there yet and to get out. Annabelle wakes up coughing up more water. She could fill a fucking aquarium by this point and the Vikings have already hidden the potion by the time she does awaken. Annabelle reveals that the voice she heard was definitely the owl they've been seeing in various places, including the party in the Feywild. Perturbed, but finally satisfied, Annabelle heads off to sleep, assuring the party that she would let at least one of them know if she takes any of the potion in the future. A few days pass, and the group has a conversation with Natasha, hoping to get a better grasp on her intentions and motivations. Natasha admits that she owes Ellie a great debt, and that it felt prudent to begin repaying that by helping out as best she could. She's been studying sleeping curses, but hasn't heard of the cursed princess Aurora from the city of Falcon. This time, Scotty is the suspicious one, eyeing Natasha very closely. Uh, our wonderfully paranoid Vikings, I love them so. Natasha begins writing down keywords that might help her continue her research on exactly what the hell is going on with Annabelle. Deciding to add her to the watch that night so she can watch a dream happen proper, Annabelle takes the dream potion again, this time with Natasha in tow psychically. For the first time, a dream repeats itself, but this time, Annabelle stands as an onlooker that dream Annabelle looks to murder before she's shaken out of her dream. Natasha begins to theorize, but decides not to worry for the night, taking some time to let her thoughts percolate. The next evening, while the Vikings enjoy a round of drinking, Kyola spends time with Njal and they talk over the Vasmir stuff, sharing a quiet moment over the ocean's horizon. The next morning, a dangerous sign is off in the horizon, a writhing mass of tentacles grabbing and clawing at the ship. Annabelle, Bjorn, and Sullen can feel their hearts sink, and they recognize this creature attacking as the fabled Kraken. Kyola feels they should flee, which Annabelle and Bjorn insist on. All hands are on deck for a bit as the adrenaline takes hold and the party thinks they are able to evade the Kraken, or at least they hope so. That evening, during another potion experiment, Annabelle struggles and thrashes against the dream instead of waking up and vomiting water as she normally does. The water foams and bubbles as Annabelle begins to spasm in her sleep. The watch panics and retrieves the rest of the party, and Natasha, who jumps into the dream and attempts to pull her from it with a comforting amount of success. Rattled by the whole thing, Natasha confiscates the potion and resolves to keep it on her so she can examine it with her alchemist kit. In addition, Natasha invites Scotty to some downtime in her room to share in some better whiskey than what's publicly available. They chat a bit about devotions and gods, but suddenly, Natasha casts Circle of Truth under Scotty and darkly tells her, Tell me everything you know about sleeping curses. Scotty, being Scotty, recounts all of her adventures with Annabelle, which Natasha diligently listens to, seeming friendly but somehow off-putting, eventually heading back to bed. Over the next few days, Sullen makes an amulet to help protect Annabelle from good and evil. They have a conversation wherein Sullen asks if Annabelle even knows who they'll find, as it sounds that Ellie has changed much since Annabelle last saw her. Annabelle wonders if it will even matter at this point. Later that evening, Annabelle with Natasha in tow takes another dose of the potion, and waking up from an insightful dream, asks for another dose to capitalize on what she's just learned, but Natasha firmly refuses. Annabelle, still antsy from the dreams, is asked by Scotty if she would like to spar to work off the rest of the energy. 
Suddenly, during the sparring session, however, Annabelle's vision goes white, and the owl appears to her, remarking that she is in fact here to offer Annabelle exactly what she wants, laying down a vial of the dream potion. Annabelle tries to pry out the information from the avian apparition, but she is vague and mysterious as fuck. The owl has a wicked proposition, however, and offers Annabelle the vial in exchange for the ownership of a bargain she made with Helga the Hag, a favor on Annabelle's birthday every year. A dark, tense heartbeat passes through the air, but Annabelle agrees and takes the vial. Later that evening, Annabelle takes said dream potion vial, and while the dream remains contextually similar, the after effects of this potion are far stronger. Annabelle awakes with a deep thirst for another dose of the dream potion. The party shows concern, but Annabelle ensures that she's fine. And while nobody believes this, she goes up to the crow's nest for privacy and eventually falls asleep up there. Eventually, the party docks at Port Vermeer, and the party stays at an inn called the Jolly Roger. Both of the Vikings eager to be off a boat for a while, the party splits up to handle various things across the city. Scotty, however, is contacted by Natasha mentally, asking if she's ready. Scotty, confused, head towards the door to see what it is that Natasha wants. Bjorn shows concern, but Scotty assures him that she'll be right back. Right back. Just she'll be right. Scotty sees Natasha with a bag in her hand and a map pointing to Mulafell, the place that Scotty is from. The next thing Scotty knows, she is in Mulafell, with Natasha standing outside of the city forge. Natasha tells Scotty that she will take her to her sister, which Scotty agrees with under a dubious set of circumstances. Despite not seeing any of her family in the various places that she could expect them, Scotty begins to become worried but she's reassured by some odd voice in her head that everything is just fine. Time passes and Scotty begins to wonder where the hell everyone is, as everyone begins to wonder where the hell Scotty is. Meanwhile, Natasha writes out several things and gives Scotty several sealed letters, one for the party, one for Inya, and one for Scotty. As Natasha continues her odd preparations, Scotty feels a very natural anxiety come over her that is quickly suppressed once again by the feeling that everything is fine. Finishing up whatever the hell she's doing, Natasha hands a pack to Scotty and opens a portal that Scotty feels weirdly compelled to- She's charmed. She's fucking charmed. Scotty is charmed. This bitch then teleported her. Scotty feels weirdly compelled to walk through the portal, but as she does with the pack in hand, she finds herself back in front of the Jolly Roger. Confused and not remembering the past few events, she looks down at the oblong pack in her hand that has a simple note stuck to the front, saying, read. Okay, okay, whoa, 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 whoa. Editing D here. Let's clarify a few things about this bit with Scotty. The scenes I described in this recap are actually part of a few scenes told over multiple episodes in and out of order, Scotty doesn't really remember exactly how all this happened. So to make sure everybody's on the same page, let's do a quick recap in this decap about what the hell is up with Natasha. So the party learns that Natasha is researching sleeping curses, which makes Scotty suspicious. During the conversation between Natasha and Sullen, where she calls him a good investment, he also promises to try and learn about curses as a favor to her. Bjorn and Sullen have their little tiff, and Bjorn says that what Sullen's running theories are contradict what the party knows about curses from their travels. Unfortunately for the party, this whole talk happens right outside of Natasha's door. Natasha then invites Scotty in, and their conversation happens, which we as the audience and the players at the time are dramatically cut away from by that dastardly GM Jess. Uh, the implication here is that Natasha does charm Scotty, but we don't actually see what happens and everything that they talk about as soon as it happens. Annabelle has a dream before they dock at Port Vermeer, where she sees a large black wolf entering the same city that they're headed for. Scotty and Bjorn reveal that they suspect it may be the same man who can shift into a large wolf that cursed their sister. So jumping back to that conversation with Natasha... We find out that Scotty has also revealed the tidbit about her sister being cursed to Natasha. She gives the vaguest of promises that she won't harm Scotty and Bjorn's sister 
but will take Scotty with her when she leaves. But Mulafel is not the only place that Natasha takes Scotty, and when she reappears in front of the Jolly Roger, she's aged by a few years. So where did Natasha take Scotty and why? Eh, you're gonna have to wait until the next recap video for all of that. But hopefully this clears up anything that was confusing about everything that just went on with Scotty, Natasha, and the teleporting and charming and stuff. Okay, I'm going to throw it back to, edit, uh, you know, video D. Have fun. Bye. I love you. And that's it. Well, that's not it. The wonderful thing about Laurelwind is that it's still going. We are chugging along now, though. The train is picking up wild steam. Annabelle's had a deep character arc. Kyola has had one of my favorite on-screen relationships that I've seen in forever, despite the fact that I can't pronounce her fucking partner's name properly. Uh, Sullen is here, and I absolutely adore him and all of his secrets. And of course, we leave off with Scotty having gone missing. Uh, in my notes, I lovingly called this section the curse saga, because good lord, there were so many curses. And we talked about the theory of curses and the intent of curses and... Just curses galore. So what was your favorite moment in this arc? Let me know down below in the comments. And if you want to catch the latest episode of Laurel Wynn, you always can at 7.30 p.m. EST on twitch.tv slash gutpunchrp. And if you want to save more time, click that bell so you can stay up to date for when the next decap drops because we still have more episodes to get through. Once again, thank you so much for watching. My name is D, and this has been the decap. Until the next time I see you, be good people. Bye.